Start. Father, we praise you, God, for all that you are, that you are all-knowing, that um, you know exactly what this country is going through, and you know what we need to do to turn hearts and minds towards you, Lord, from all eternity. You've always known what's going to happen, and Lord Jesus, you are the Logos. You are the foundation, the grounds for logic and, and reason itself, Lord. You metaphysically are truth itself, Lord Jesus, you tell us. And so um, we believe that, and we have good reasons for believing that, God. And I pray that tonight, as we talk about the philosophical foundations for the biblical worldview, I pray, God, that we'll all be attentive and enthusiastic about learning, um, that you'll help me to be accurate and precise, and that your people will be equipped. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so I have a series called Grounded, and you saw, you've seen the devil's advocate part of that, that usually I have the devil's advocate part, and then I have the philosophical foundation part, which you're going to see now, and then after that I go into the arguments for God's existence, and then the reliability of the scriptures, and that sort of thing. You're probably familiar with some of these steps, since you are here at Ratio Christi, so this, this is what this is, Grounded curriculum. Um, philosophy. We're going to be talking about. Is anybody here a philosophy major? They got philosophy major here? I assume so, right? Yes. It exists. It exists. <laughs> it exists, but not on any of you guys' transcript, right? <laughs> oh, philosophy is simply a rational investigation into the true nature of reality. It's broad. Every discipline uses philosophy, okay? So whenever you do science, you're doing philosophy. Whenever you do history, you're doing philosophy. Whenever you read a book, you're doing philosophy. Okay, so philosophy is the missing part, I'm going to be arguing, of your intellectual diet for the most part. But since you go here, you're probably going to get a, 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 a good dose of it. All the disciplines actually are going to have to touch on philosophy. Every discipline, whatever it is, chemistry, biology, anything, is going to have to touch on philosophy in somehow, in some way. So I'm going to be explaining the role that philosophy has in the Christian life. You can't read the Bible and not do philosophy. You can't not do philosophy. Double negative intended. Okay. Um, what does PhD stand for? Doctor of philosophy. Very good. Philosophy doctor. Doctor of philosophy. That's what that means. So your professors, a lot of them have PhDs, right? Uh, this title, PhD, has been around for centuries. It used to be considered philosophy was the discipline that all other disciplines touch upon. But in our lifetime, philosophy is hardly taught at all. The average person does not know what philosophy is, and they don't do it very well, okay? As um, I'm going to be talking about today. So you can get a PhD in anything, okay? Biology, chemistry, computer science, all of these you can get a PhD in, okay? Uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, something has changed. Prior to the 1800s, Christianity was considered a rational religion, and Christians valued the mind, and Christians dominated in the areas of science and philosophy. Once we get to the 1800s, some things started to change. We have many people considering Christianity an irrational religion, <coughs> and fewer Christians are valuing the mind today, okay? uh, unlike Ratio Christi. So you guys, I'm sure you come in contact with that all the time, that Christians are like, no, nah, you just got to believe. And so that's why I, I lead with the devil's advocate uh, session that you saw, is so that that kind of shows Christians, if you're not prepared, then you look foolish, right? Uh, secularists today dominate in science, and philosophy is considered dead, okay? Now, there's a natural and spiritual slash moral explanation for what's going on. Um, here's, it's kind of connected together, but I'm going to give you the natural explanation. The scientific revolution was good, Right? It was great. I'm not going to be knocking science at all. What I'm going to be doing in this presentation is I'm going to be arguing that we need to elevate philosophy to its rightful position. So in the, what happened was in the scientific revolution, 1550 to 1700, when we date that, lots of scientific, um, scientifically uh, empirical evidence started disproving what some of the classical philosophers believed, such as geocentrism. What's that? Yeah, the Earth is the center of the solar system. Um, the philosophers of old used to believe that. Now we know that's not true. But you can't just sit there and try to use philosophy to figure out and be like, I bet you the Earth is the center. Uh, you, you have to actually do scientific observation. Okay? 
And so the natural sciences started replacing philosophy. A lot of the classical philosophers were wrong about their science. But what happened was people started throwing away philosophy altogether. And that's pretty much where we are today. In the 21st century, philosophy is usually it's, not a, it's usually a course that nobody even takes. If you do take it, you're getting more than likely really bad philosophy. Okay, so we're going to get some good philosophy in today. Now here's why this is important. Classical philosophy, well I say classical philosophy, does anybody know what I mean? The philosophy of who? Plato. Yeah, Plato and Aristotle. Those guys. Okay? Uh, those guys would be appalled to hear about what's going on today. All right, um, because a lot of a lot of their their uh, principles aren't even taught anymore. They've been lost. Well, they haven't been lost. They've been. We have them, but most people don't try to access them at all. But you're going to get a little bit of of their teachings today. Um, today, secularists are dominating in universities, and there's this gradual collapse of good philosophy. Classical philosophy is necessary to defend the Christian faith. Without it, you actually don't have your tools that is necessary to demonstrate that Christianity is true. Well, so whether you know that or not, when you do apologetics, you are doing more than likely classical philosophy, whether you knew it or not. Okay? So the problem today, unbelievers have used this as an opportunity to attack the Christian faith. These issues like uh, how do you define marriage? Uh, when does life begin in the womb? Uh, what role does government play in the society? These are philosophy, philosophical questions. Okay? Now, today most people no longer think Christianity is a rational religion, and the church's response in general has been reject science and philosophy and hide from our evil culture. Is that what you, can't you guys attest to that? That's what you see? That's why you're here, because you're frustrated that Christians doing that all the time, all right? Now, you've heard this before, right? People will say, well, you've got, you got science and then faith, and they're these separate spheres. Have you heard this before? They say, well, I have my science, and then I have my beliefs. I have my faith. Okay, my morals, and they act like they're two different spheres here. Well, what do you think unites them? Philosophy, Philosophy is the sphere of, is the discipline that actually unites them together. Ph philosophical principles are grounded in science, and they are actually used to verify <coughs> religion and morality. Okay, those principles are. So this is uh, an important part here, that you're stuck, without philosophy, you're stuck with that which is how most people view it today. Okay. Now, does anybody know what fideism is? Without reading that. <laughs> what is fideism? Yes? I know it because that's how my family is. Faith alone is like all you need. You don't need any evidence for faith. All you need is... Very good. Spoiling. Yes, which is terrible because that's what's screwing up the church. Fideism, now, fide means faith in Latin. Fideism is the belief that all you need is faith, you don't need reason. That you don't need any evidence or anything like that. Now, when we read the Bible, we know that I am saved by my faith. That does not mean I believe Christianity is true because I just choose to have faith. I have reasons for believing that Christian faith is true, and then after that, I am trusting in Christ for salvation. That doesn't mean I just choose to believe that it's, it's true with no reasons, okay? Fideism is unscriptural, it's irrational, and it's a losing position. And this is the position that the church had in the 20th century. And this is why we have groups like Rashi Christi. It's because every group should naturally be doing what your mission is. is using reason. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with what? Yeah, heart, soul, strength, mind, all of it, right? He didn't only say heart or only say mind. It's, it's everything. So that's what uh, we're emphasizing here, also with your mind. Now, to know that Christianity is true and that God exists, you've got to have the correct philosophical position or, or foundation. Now, uh, I use the three-step method when I am arguing that Christianity is true. Now, you can be a Christian and not have any good reasons for being a Christian because, thank God, the standard for salvation is extremely low, right? All you have to do is... is admit I'm a sinner and I and basically God has said okay Brian all you have to do is admit that you can't do this yourself I can't do it myself you're safe good job good job <laughs> yeah it's not a theology lesson okay um, it's not a, a, some kind of advanced theological test these things help you grow in your faith right and you're more effective more fruitful as a Christian but it's not necessary for salvation or else we'd be in trouble 
So, but if you want to be able to defend the faith, and that's why you're here, you got to have a little more. Okay. Um, so let's just say I'm at the I'm talking to somebody about the Christian faith, and I say, you know, Jesus died for your sins. I'm up here in the in the uh, pyramid, and they'll say, well, I, I don't think Jesus ever lived. And then I start giving reasons for believing that Jesus lived, and then the guy goes, well, I don't even think God exists. Well, now I'm not arguing Christianity is true anymore. Now I got to argue what that there's a God. And then the guy says, well, that's true for you, but not for me. Well, then now i got to explain philosophically why that's <laughs> incorrect. And i got to give reasons for believing that if something is true, then everybody should believe. Does that make sense? And so sometimes you don't know where to start with a person. Do you start with the Christian faith? Do you start with God? Do you start with philosophy? Okay? But we've got to be equipped for all of it. Now, in the modern era, there's an assault on our foundation. And it's caused people to doubt the Christian faith. People are looking at this worldview through a different lens. So watch this. We're going to put on a new set of glasses. Are we ready? Here we go. Here they come. Boom. Oh, we got new glasses on. Aren't you impressed? <laughs> Look at that. Oh, dear. There is no truth. There's no God. Christians are intolerant. Whatever you believe is true is true for you. Okay? So if you're taught, and I'm sure you, you run into people all the time, they have this belief that whatever, there is no such thing as truth. You can't know it's true. So if they believe that, that you can't know what's true, mainly as it applies to religion especially, then when you come along and you say, no, it's true, Christianity is true, how do you sound to somebody who doesn't think you can know truth? Like, yeah, like an idiot or what? Arrogant. Arrogant. You sound like you know the truth and nobody else does. You sound into, That's how we come across. So a lot of times it's good to try to understand what do other people hear when they hear me saying Jesus died for your sins and I know this is true? They're like, well, yeah, you can't decide that because you can't know it's true. So once you know what they believe, then sometimes it's, a lot, uh, it's always easier to then talk to them, right? Um, now, we are currently living in the dark age of philosophy. You know, we're like, oh, the dark ages. and the, They didn't understand science. Well, now we don't understand philosophy. It's actually what's going on. 800 years ago, we had great philosophy in the West. Science, not so great. Okay? Today, great science. Horrible philosophy. It's reversed. Okay? It's actually reversed. Now, you guys know this gentleman is here, right? Stephen Hawking? He's no dummy, is he? Smart guy. Smart guy. But I want you to notice what he says here. See if you can catch this error here. Um, this is in his book, The Grand Design. He says, what is the nature of reality? Did the universe need a creator? Traditionally, these are questions for what? Philosophy, but then he says, philosophy is dead, and scientists have become the bearers of the torch and the quest for knowledge. What's wrong with that? Do you see this statement? Oh, man. You guys are like, you guys are ready to just pounce on this. We've had training. Yes, say it again. It's a philosophical statement. It's a philosophical statement. What were you going to say? I mean, yeah, it's basically the same thing. He's making an assumption of truth. Yeah, he, he is making a philosophical statement about science and philosophy by saying that. Yeah. The title of this book also contradicts this statement because the title of the book says create design. Design, we need creator. So you can't say. Yeah, there's no designer, but it was designed. That's what he argues in the book. That's a good point. You know what? I've never even thought of that before. That's a really good point because that's what he goes to. You don't need a designer for the grand design. I actually never thought about it. That's a good point. Uh, now, I also want you to, what else is interesting on this page that we already talked about a second ago? What is he, his philosophy is dead. What's interesting? What does he have? What's his degree? PhD. Yeah. He's got a PhD. He's a philosophy doctor. His degree is dead. Here's the thing. I'm not picking on the guy. The guy's a genius, but he has not been trained in philosophy. This is something that a rookie would mis mistake in philosophy. This is, uh, he just hasn't been taught how to think philosophically, which is why when we give out degrees and we call them PhDs today, it's like, eh, just take the PH away because it's, it's not really a PH, it's just a D. <laughs> so uh, today the average person just doesn't know how to think anymore. And it's a great movie, but that's, that's us. That's, uh, that's our culture. Many people treat issues of truth and morality like floating bubbles. They just pick the one they like. Well, I like this one. I, I like the idea that you, know, you can define you know, whatever, whatever gender you want or find marriage however you want or whatever, whatever religion you want. I, I like Taoism. I want that one to be my religion. I pick it. That's what we do. Instead of actually trying to 
to ground our, um, our beliefs. You've got to learn how to organize our beliefs and to ground them. How do we demonstrate that? It's true, right? Um, so today, evangel- can we turn the lights off only for this part? Oh, something special is coming. You feel it, don't you? Uh, today, evangelism is more difficult and Christians doubt the faith because our foundation has been destroyed. Okay? We're going to get hit with five philosophies that contradict the biblical worldview. This is what you get hit with all the time. You get hit with it in college. You get hit with it in, by the media. Five bad philosophies. Here's what you get hit with. One here, scientism. Scientism is the belief that science is the only way to know the truth about reality. We'll talk more about that uh, later on. And then materialism. Matter is the only thing that exists. The material world is the only thing that is knowable. And we get hit with relativism. Truth and morality are relative. There's nothing that's true for everybody or right for everybody. And we get hit with pluralism. All religions are true. They all lead to God. So if you're religious, that's okay. As long as you say what? Yeah, the, the, we all go to the same God. That's what pluralism is. You guys have been studying that recently, right? Yes, sir. Pluralism. So we we'll, we'll talk about that very, very briefly today. And then lastly, naturalism. All events are from natural causes. There are no supernatural events. Now, what is gonna, what's going to happen to my pyramid here? It's going to crumble. It's going to go... <laughs> they, they blew a hole in my pyramid. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, isn't that cool? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is what happened to me in college. My pyramid got blown to pieces. I was an undergraduate. That's why I do this for a living now. And then the pyramid's going to fall over. What does that mean about the truth of Christianity? It just slides right off. And that's, that's what's happened to us today. Okay, you can turn the lights back on now. That was the, my, that's my special little cartoon there, my new animation. So these are our five philosophies. Oh, I got an applause. All right. Thank you. Well, four of you. Uh, uh, these five philosophies, we're going to deal with them today very quickly. Uh, you can deal with them by using some good philosophy. These are, now, you may not remember all of these terms when you leave here. That's fine. I'm hoping that you'll at least remember the ideas behind them. More than likely, you will remember the gist of what I'm saying. Okay? And it's being recorded, so you can just watch it again later on. Now, so these three good philosophies are necessary for combating these five bad philosophies. So classical empiricism, which we're going to be talking about in a little bit, this deals with how do we discover what's true. Foundationalism deals with how do we think about what's true, the laws of logic. And then the correspondence view of truth, how we define what is true. Have you guys gone through truth in here? Are you guys familiar with this then? Good, 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 good. Uh, now these three good philosophies here, watch this. Uh, oh, makes up our philosophical foundation. See that? These three good philosophies here, this is all you need to actually combat bad philosophy. The the Bible does assume these positions here. To defend these three philosophical positions is to defend the Bible. Is to defend the biblical worldview. The Bible assumes these and does teach them. Okay? Uh, They're part of the biblical worldview. We'll talk about what, what they are later on. Right now, they're just words to you. We'll define what they are a little bit later. Okay? So first of all, let's knock these out one by one. Scientism. Scientism is the belief that empirical observation is the only way to know the truth about reality. What, is, what do I mean by empirical observation? Yeah, just your data. yeah data that you access how? Through the senses. Experimentation. Observation. Very good. Got to see it. Why is this a problem for the Christian faith? Yeah, you can't see God. I can't see morality, I can't see God, right? So God is not observable. Now, I'm the bad guy here. <laughs> if you want to call me the bad guy. Now we don't have to worry about, that's me. Yeah. I just picked a, like a strange picture of myself. Be a picture. <laughs> so if I said, I use science instead of philosophy, that's identical to saying, I don't know what philosophy is. That's basically what somebody would be saying. Because you'll hear people talk that way, like... Um, when um, Stephen Hawking said that, he was revealing he doesn't, hasn't had anybody explain what philosophy is, or he never would have said philosophy is dead. Okay, you, it's, it's impossible for that to, uh, to be true. So science and philosophy, if you try to separate them, it's going to lead to contradictions. Okay? Um, so first of all, classical empiricism, this will be our first good philosophy that I'm going to be explaining. Here's what I mean. Does anybody know what it is before I go through it? Is that just like logical statements leading to a logical conclusion? 
Um, it's no. This this oh, would be. Racism, well, in, um, this is a uh, another. Co there's there's strict empiricism, but I'm going to separate that from what I'm calling classical empiricism. Okay, classical empiricism deals with how do you know. That if something is, is uh, true or not. How do you know, how do you access reality? Classical empiricism is this. This is the position of Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, if you know these guys. It's a position that knowledge is built as we observe reality, use my senses, and then we extract true principles about reality as we think about it. Okay, and so the, um, what I'm saying is we use our senses to look at reality and we go, na 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 Okay? Say it with me. Na 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 na. Yes. If you're if you're new here, this is a cult, and we always we always make this sound when we see each other on campus. <laughs> okay. Uh, we learn truths by observing reality with our senses, and then we go na 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 na. We extract these these principles. You do it all the time. And okay, right now, as I'm talking, these ideas are coming into your head. You're extracting principles. Okay. When you read a book. You're not doing science. You're extracting principles. Do you understand? Um, uh, reading words that, that are that you are using your senses. Okay. So we do philosophy every time we extract principles from reality. The principles themselves are not observed. They are abstracted. What does abstract mean? Summarize, like general report. If I talk about like like numbers are. Abstract. No way of understanding. Yeah, no, there's, there are ideas in the mind. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's concrete that you're that you are that you're seeing. Yeah, metaphysical. That the way that they exist would be in an abstract way. Okay. Um, so since what I'm saying is sense experience plus reason, this is abstracting the principles, is how we obtain knowledge and understanding. Okay, this is important. What I'm doing, because you're like. He's just doing like a philosophy lesson. What is he going to do? I promise this is important. Uh, you'll see by the end, I'm going to pull it all together. <laughs> pull it all together. You'll, you'll see by the end. Okay. Um, okay, does everybody see this here? The philosophical crusher, and I know I won't be able to hold your attention until this engine gets fully crushed. So just watch. Yes, crush it. Yes. Okay. Okay, now, now. Now the universe has been balanced out. Now we're okay. <laughs> now you can listen to the guy in front talk. Uh, the philosophical crusher is simply uh, when we hold a position to its own standard. Okay, um, you've done this probably with uh, truth claims, probably in here already. So it's when you hold a position to itself. For example, if I said there's no such thing as truth, you've done this before, right? How to hold that position to itself? If there's no such thing as truth. Apply that position to that. Is that true? There you go. So you run it through the crusher, and can it survive? That statement can't be true. So it gets shredded, right? That statement has to be false. Have I got the principle? You've done this before. So this will be easy with you guys. So what if I said, if you can't observe something, then you can't know it's true? Empirical observation is the only way to know the truth. What's empirical again? Like observable. Yeah, observable with my senses. I can see it. Uh, hear it, taste it, whatever, that the way you learn is actually you have your senses access something and then you extract the, princi the principles, okay? So let's run this through the philosophical crusher here. Take this principle and apply it to itself. If you can't observe it, you can't know it's true. Can we observe that? Very good. Is that, if you can't observe it, can't know it's true, did you observe that? Is that a thing that you saw? Like if I said, hey man, I was pulling out of my neighborhood the other day and if you can't observe it, can't know it's true, can blindside me and hit me. I hate if you can't observe it, can't know it's true. I hate that guy. Um, so if you can't observe it, can't know it's true. What is that? Is it fuzzy? If you can't observe it, can't know it's true. Does it make noises? If you can't observe it, can't know it's true. What does that look like? What color is that? If you can't observe it, can't know it's true. Have you, can you lick it? Is it sour? Is it spicy? What does it smell like? So, I mean, so if you can't observe it, can't know it's true, that's not something that you can see or access empirically. So if you can't observe it, can't know it's true, what does that mean about that belief? It's false. It has to be false. It cannot hold up to its own test. Plato, you guys know the philosopher Plato, he argued that the very first test 
you should ever use against a philosophical position to see if it's true or false is to apply it to itself. Is that, isn't that cool? See what we're doing here? Um, what about the scientific method? Uh, observation, hypothesis, test, experiment. Scientific method is good, but what is it? It's a philosophical statement to start. Perfect. Yes. Yes, you guys are good. Obi-Wan has taught you well. <laughs> Actually, apologists are Sith Lords, by the way. So <laughs> We are Sith Lords. The, those weak Jedi. A whole army of them can't take us on. Anyway, uh, this is the philosophy of how to do science. The scientific method is good. I'm not knocking science. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm bringing philosophy back up. Um, the scientific method is the philosophy of how to do science. Do you observe the scientific method? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? Can, can, is it fuzzy? All that stuff. It's the same thing. If you, can, you, you, can you use the scientific method on the scientific method? No. So it can't be true that science is the only way to learn the truth about reality. See what I mean? Because then you couldn't know about science. You see? <laughs> yes. So no, can't, it's not something that you observe. So where do you get science from? The scientific method. Because it's a good method. I'm not throwing it away. Very good. Here I went, na 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 Say it with me. na 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 my goal, my goal is that one day I will actually be watching some guy on like YouTube and he's going to be like, okay, so the way we learn it is na 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 like After I hear somebody copy me, I'll be like, my work here on earth is done. <laughs> They've copied my noise. <laughs> That's my trademark. No, 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 no. So let's say this guy's got a rock here, he throws it in the water, bloop, it sinks. How does he know it's going to sink the next time he throws it? He can't be like, well, I saw it sink in the past. All things that happened in the past will always happen again. You can't say that. How do you, how, why did it sink? It's not... Yeah. In other words, you've abstracted that. What you've done is you've gone like this. Na 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 na. Once you observe rock, water, the um, the nature of a rock, nature of water, gravity, and buoyancy, whatever's denser than water is gonna well, it's gonna sink. That's what you do. Okay, so you don't have to keep on throwing a rock and be like, is it gonna sink this time? Well, it'll sink again. You don't have to keep doing that. That you can learn. You've abstracted that, those principles. Like uh, if you on a flat plane, if you draw a uh, triangle and then you add up the angles, what does it come up to? 180 degrees. You don't have to keep on being like, well, what about this next triangle? It's going to keep doing it. Unless you draw it on a ball, by the way. You guys know that, right? Mm -hmm. You draw it on a ball, suddenly it's like it's not 180. Like, Whoa, it's magic. Okay? Um, but you, but it's, if it's on flat surface, you don't have to keep on adding it up because that's the nature of a triangle. So if I say we can't detect God scientifically with our senses, so there's no reason to believe he exists. Why should I believe God exists? Because that's correct. I don't see him. Like Josh here, um, I, if you guys remember, I did a Devil's Advocate talk. How many of you guys were here for that? Almost most of you. Um, if you remember, I, for example, if I said, how do you know Josh exists? Because you're going to say what? You can see him, but if you couldn't see him, you can smell him. You can taste him, hear him. Basically, you're going to walk me through the five senses, but if you didn't have your five senses, could you know Josh exists? No, you could not. Same thing with God. I don't see God, but I do use my senses to know He exists. Not because I see Him, but what do I do? I abstract principles that lead me to conclude that there's a God, okay? Um, this is my daughter. My children are going to be the ones who like, are beating me up in these arguments, as you'll be saying. So uh, this is my daughter here. God's existence is known through abstracted principles. In fact, the Bible teaches this. You know, the Bible actually teaches classical empiricism. In Romans 1, it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen. How? They're understood from what has been made. In other words, Paul is saying, You know there's a God because you did this. No, 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 Yes, you are now mine. Yes. Only your hatred can destroy me. <laughs> anyway, you know, um, did anybody see like uh, the, um, what's the, 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 the new Star Wars that came out? Rogue One. The Rogue One. The best scene for me was at the end when Darth Vader came out. 
I have to admit, when he came out there attacking the Rebels, I was like, yeah, get him. I'm, I, I said, Floyd, I'm on his team. And he's just so cool to me. Anyway, <laughs> um, so the Bible teaches that God's existence is inferred from nature. That I look at this world and I extract these principles. For example, you know, the, uh, the uh, horizontal argument for God's existence, uh, cosmology argument, that everything that begins to exist has a cause. Well, that's an abstracted principle. The universe began to exist. That's another abstracted principle. Put them together, we infer what? The universe had a cause. Okay? So what you're doing is you're using abstracted principles to conclude that. You didn't see God, but you saw things that led you to abstract those principles. Okay? Um, so materialism, this is really cool. Okay. Matter is the only thing that exists, according to this, to this uh, um, philosophical position, only the material world is, is knowable. Why is that a problem for Christianity? Because God is not material. Very good. God is immaterial. We don't see God. He's not made out of matter, right? Yeah. Well, light's not made out of matter either. So, I mean, we can see if it's not made out of matter. So that yeah, well, light's weird because it's like a, the particle and the wave. Huh? It doesn't have math. Yeah, well, yeah. In fact, yeah, there's, there's, plenty, there's plenty of counterexamples that we're going to be using. In fact, um, um, we'll, we'll get to that in a second because I'm going to argue space also. But I'm, I'm going to teach you something else really cool that, that probably most of you haven't heard before in a second. But first of all, let's run it through the philosophical question. The material world is all that exists. Nothing is immaterial. Apply that position to itself. Is that material? Yeah. Is that idea a material object? Materialism cannot be true. It can't be. Because materialism is not a material thing. It's, 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 but yet, all the time, people will have this position. Um, any, anyway, um, space. You know, space is a thing. I used to just think it was like emptiness. But space, you know, Einstein proved that space is actually a thing with properties. It's bendable. It's distortable. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? That light travels with the so-called fabric of, of, of space. So space is a brilliant, is a great counterexample that it's real, has properties, it's a thing, but it's not matter. Okay. Now um, I'm going to show you something that's really cool. Oh yes, here we go. Pay attention, you're in training. You know um, when Mr. Miyagi, you guys have all seen this movie, right? If you haven't, then you should. Mr. Miyagi starts saying, "Okay, show me sand the floor," and he starts, "Hey, like, oh, you've been teaching me to block the whole time. Oh, oh, I should have taken my." Chores more seriously. You know, pluralism, naturalism, scientism, relativism. <laughs> yeah, he's it. Yeah, he's it. <laughs> this bow. Yeah, da, 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 da. look I always look I. <laughs> That's what we're doing right now. I'm not just giving you a little philosophy lesson. I'm getting ready to throw some punches at you, so you're, you've been learning to block. This is really cool here. Um, which of these clay objects looks like a lion? This is not a trick question. It's not a trick question. I think that one, but you're going to say maybe that one? <laughs> no, that looks like a lion, but how do you know? If, if, it's, if it matters all there is, how would you know? Wouldn't it just be clay equals clay equals clay? If matters all there is, then how do you know the difference? Because what's that? You should be like, well, that's just clay. What's that? It's clay. It's clay. So how can you tell them apart? Because you can. Distinguishing features. Yeah, but what do you mean by that? Yes, features. Yes, you very good. You've abstracted the features and the shapes, okay? Well, what is shapeness made out of? Whoa. Oh, this is deep. <laughs> My kid, why? Because it just is. Uh, uh, what is shapeness made out of? It's a category mistake. It's not made out of anything. <laughs> Matter is put in a shape because you're like, oh, okay. Class, <laughs> it's not made out of something. <laughs> um, arrangement is not a material thing, but matter gets arranged. Matter is put in a shape. See what I mean? Shapeness is abstracted. It's not a physical thing. Physical things get put in shape. Okay. Um, so when you see the matter, your mind is abstracting the arrangement of the matter as well. Something else is there. There's actually no such thing as only matter. There's no such thing as pure matter. This is what um, Einstein. I mean, not Einstein. <laughs> Aristotle, <laughs> the other smart guy but they're a long time apart. Um, this right here has what we call the form of a lion. Have they done anything on form and matter? Only last time you were here and did something. 
Oh, you're going to like this then. It, this really helped me understand a lot of things. I was like, oh, it, I'm getting ready to take a whole other category of thought and put it in your mind. So pay close attention because when I learned this, I was like, oh, I just leveled up in the world of understanding. I've learned this new thing. Well, how come nobody's talked about this before? Um, this guy, I think you're going to get a classical philosophy class. It's really cool. Uh, this lion has the, this clay here is in the form of a lion. There's no such thing as pure matter. All matter has form. Anytime you try to say, well, yeah, that chair is just matter, but that chair has the form, that matter there has the form of what we call chair. So anything you point out to me, you're going to be able to distinguish its form. What about a rock? Well, now you're talking about matter that's in the form of a rock. You see what I mean? It doesn't matter um, what you're going to point to. Um, so, so watch this. This same clay right here, we're going to get deep into this in a little bit. Uh, th this clay line right here can be reformed into what? Look like the human. And that can be reformed to look like a block of clay. If we reform it, what the matter was what? The same the whole time. But what was different? The form was. Do you understand? The form changed. The matter was the exact same. What is um, this clicker? What's it made out of? Yeah, get, get down lower. <laughs> yeah, what well, kind? Like protons, neutrons, electrons, right? What's that chair made out of? Protons, neutrons, electrons. What's this table? The same thing. What am I? Protons, neutrons, electrons. Uh, if you take protons, now we don't know how to completely do this, but hypothetically you could do this. Uh, you could take uh, me, protons, neutrons, electrons, rearrange me, theoretically, and make a piece of wood or a toilet bowl. <laughs> or a table or uh, water because what is water? Protons, electron, electrons, right? Uh, all, in other words, that's all the, the matter is simply rearranged so that it takes on a new form. Okay? Um, all material objects have what we call matter and form. Okay? So when I look at a Coke can, for example, my mind goes, no, 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 no. I'm not saying there's a ghost inside the Coke can and it came out. But when I look at a Coke can, what's in my mind? Like, I want everybody to picture an elephant right now. Sure. Make it pink. Everybody make it pink. You got the pink elephant in your mind? Okay. Uh, how did it get there? Weird. Yes, isn't that weird? How is it there? Now, did the matter of the elephant just go into your mind? No. I want everybody to think of 100 pounds. Did you just gain 100 pounds? <laughs> no, you did not. That idea is it. Okay? So the form of things can enter your mind. Okay? When we talk about the form, we don't only mean the material arrangement. We mean more than that. It's um, immaterial properties as well. Okay? I want to talk about that a, a little bit. It's so my son Caleb here. He looks at dogs and his mind, watch this, he looks at them and then he goes, na 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 na. He extracts their form and he creates the category of dog in his mind. And in English, we put the label dog on that form. So when I say dog, I know everybody in this room knows what I mean. Now, you may be picturing your dog, but you still know what I mean. You understand? And in, if you, how do you say, how do you say dog in French? How do you say it? Okay. I'll take your word on that. <laughs> uh, it's the same idea, the same form, but it's a different linguistic label. Okay. Uh, now, by grasping the form, you grasp its nature, and by grasping its nature, you can grasp its properties and potentials. Okay? So well, these are my three kids. When, when they think of a dog, it's in their mind. The idea is in their mind. This is what makes communication possible. This is why everybody in this room, when I start saying, you can understand what I'm saying, because the ideas that I'm expressing are now coming into your mind. Isn't that cool? All right? Um, this is what makes communication possible, is you take these forms, and you label them. Give them a, linguist, a linguistic label, and that's how we communicate. When you read, that's what you're doing. Okay? Um, so truth is public. Um, it can exist in many minds, which is why communication is possible. Um, now watch this. Let's just say, in God's mind, God decides, I'm going to create a dog. The dog form is in his mind. And then watch this. He goes down here, and he takes some matter down here. You watching this? He takes some matter, and then he puts it in the form of a dog. That's what the Bible says he does, right? Now, we come along and we look at that dog and what do we do? 
its form goes na 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 now we think of a dog now that form is actually existing in how many places here it's in God's mind it's right here in the matter and in your mind this is why we would say yes you have direct access to reality the truth about reality is knowable it is abstracted okay and this is where philosophy kind of took a bad turn with um, uh, John Locke and uh, Hume and Kant later on if you're familiar with those guys that they argued well you don't really have access to reality you only have access to a copy of reality in your mind Aristotle said no no no, no. you don't have access to just a copy you have direct access to the actual form of a dog the more you learn more about a dog the more that form is abstracted and is refined and perfected in your mind more and more and more does that make sense that it's immaterial properties the idea of it is perfected in your mind so it's not like well I don't really know what a dog is because I only have access to what I think a dog is no I actually really do have access to the dog's form because to say I don't know what a dog is what did I just say I had to identify a dog in order to say I can't identify a dog so that's self-defeating okay have I got it so when I look at a dog I start abstracting these principles like it's cute it's a pack animal it's better than cats yes. <laughs> these are all true things that we abstract about about dogs okay uh, did your matter exist a thousand years ago did your matter exist a thousand years ago what do you think uh, I usually have everybody say no good for you usually I have to be like so you think you made your matter all right you guys aren't as fun because <laughs> you know things yes your matter existed a thousand years ago you didn't make your own matter when you're in your mommy's tummy she ate food and that got added to your body right um, then you were born and what do you do you eat when you eat you're taking in plants and fruit because that's all you eat right and candy bars and all that stuff being added to you. you you physically literally are what you eat then your body's designed to take that and then tr reform it transform it and use it for energy and distribute it throughout your body as, as it's needed okay um, but that uh, that fruit that you ate used to be on a tree how did that get there it was a seed water came adds matter it starts extracting nutrients from the soil to actually make that so when you eat fruit you're eating something that used to be what yeah water and dirt and probably manure huh and sunlight yes okay um, did your form exist a thousand years ago uh, no not in this actual world but your form technically has always existed where in God's mind isn't that cool yes God has literally never stopped thinking about you that cool? Um, so watch this. You are composed of matter and form. Now watch this. This will suddenly start making a lot of sense to you. When we say you have matter, that's your body. But when we say in philosophy, when we talk about you having a form, does anybody know what we call a living form? I have a form. You have a form. This can has a form. That's why when I say the, co the sun drop can, you can picture it because its form is in your mind. What do we call a living form? soul that's what we mean by soul the word soul just means something that's living Do you know this it's not like I used to think like a soul is like this little ghost thing that has to like fly into a body and like and turn it on or something like that instead by soul we simply mean the form of the body now in philosophy anything that's alive is actually called a soul so we have a plant will be called a vegetative soul um, animals would have animal souls you have a rational soul okay I'm not saying that Jesus died for trees and that their souls go to heaven God only promised that that our souls continue to exist and he also promised that all of my uh, former pets will also continue to exist I don't know about yours but mine will, will, will be resurrected again <laughs> yes Right. Right. Can we, in the same way, can we see the souls of other people, or is this 
Or, or, only in the sense that like the more you know somebody, you've abstracted that person's uh, properties that they would have, which we would call you know personality or something like that. So yeah, um, in that sense, yeah. The, the, the idea of this person is in your mind. That's why when you think of each person, I mean, there's a lot more properties that come into your head than if you look at a tree. You know, the way people act, their tendencies, their personality, their strengths, weaknesses, right? All that stuff comes into play, yeah. Um, based on what you were just saying a moment ago, I think that falls into the category of how in the beginning he tell, God tells Adam and Eve, you have mastery over everything. I give you full dominion over plant, animal, land, everything. Right, because you're a special kind of... Like you have special powers in your mind. That you have the power to reason. You can understand universal concepts and things like that. Yeah. This may be on a tangent, but since humans have like have the ability to have salvation, where's where where does like animals stand then, or like like where animals are at? Or Doesn't like, say, but they are called um, animals in 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 Hebrew. It will use the same word for soul to talk about them as living things. But you can always. Ask God to resurrect your pets if you want to. Have no clue will say yes to that. And you can make fun of me if you want to. But I've actually asked God if he'll resurrect my dead dog, Timmy, one day on the new earth. Because I love him and miss him. He may say no. I don't know. But you can always ask. You have not because you ask not. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see. So when I get to heaven, I have all my pets. And you're like, what? Am I not here? But God, I should have asked. I asked. There's all my dogs. I'm like a Disney character. Yeah. It, you, for, for living beings, I'll use the same word for, um, for calling humans a living being. Okay, so yeah, like the word anima, you know, where we get the word animal, it just means a living thing. Like, you know, animation, like uh, you are a living thing. But you are a special kind of living thing. You are a rational living biological being. Yes, yeah, so you do have different abilities, okay? So that's just pretty cool. Or like a T-Rex. Uh, so uh, the material arrangement, the immaterial properties, your intellect, all this stuff, the powers of your brain, yes, your brain is material. But there's these other properties that are actually current with your brain, aren't there? These immaterial properties that actually are uh, of your mind. Okay. Now, what does the Bible say in Genesis? Then the Lord God what? Form. form. Ah, you ever notice it worded this way? We got this far in our devotions, right? <laughs> then the Lord God formed man of the dust or the matter, and then man became what? And that is the Hebrew word there that just means soul. Became a living being. Isn't that cool? Ah, this is good. This is good classical philosophy. God, you know, is a uh, classical philosopher, so so should you be. Okay, relativism. What is relativism? I have five minutes. I need about 15. Yeah, because we've been taking questions throughout. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Take, take, uh, so what we'll do is take, what, 15 minutes for, to let them finish and then... Yeah, how do we hold questions until I'm done? Yeah. Um, is, that, is that cool? Yeah, we can... We can you guys didn't have anything you need to do, did you? You can leave at nine. That's fine. Brian's just going to steamroll through. Though. Yeah, so let's hold questions at the end to make sure that we can... Uh, a little faster. Uh, relativism uh, is the belief that truth and morality are relative. They're neither universal nor absolute. Meaning there's nothing that's true for you or right for you that's also necessarily true for somebody else to believe or right for them to believe. Okay? Why is that a problem for Christianity? It's in one truth. Yeah, because the Bible teaches that truth and morality are, are universal and absolute. Okay? Um, for example, God said the day that you eat the fruit, you will die. Satan said you will what? Not die. Can they both be true? Ah, oh, it's a contradiction. It can't both be true. So truth is relative to each person. There's nothing that is true for all people at all times and all places. Run that through the philosophical crusher. Is that, is that a relative truth? Yeah. Is relativism true for everybody? No. Relativism self-defeats. I can't believe it's still around. Is relativism true for everybody? No. If you say yes, then it's false. If you say no... Then why are we even talking about it? So for a relativist to actually have a logical conversation, they can't. 
You can't make any statements because you're always making truth claims. Whenever you make a statement, all you can do is just sit in the corner and drool. And don't, just, ah, just don't say anything true because you can't. Um, so foundationalism, the laws of logic, we're going to knock these two out here now. Uh, why can't contradictions be true? Why can't I be a human and not a human at the same time, same sense? Okay, well, um, why does matter take up space? But why does it do that? Why is 2 plus 2, 4? Because we have nothing would be knowable. But why? Because we have dictated because it is. We've assigned values to 2 and 2, and thus putting them together, we get the value that we've assigned. Can I assign? Can I assign the answer to be 5? If you change the entirety of the relativity of 2 and 2. Now I'm going to keep that the same, but I'm going to change that to 5. You guys are being mean. You're being very mean to me. Who are you to say that I can't do this? I identify as that being 5. <laughs> In other words, why? Because it is. Because it just is. Uh, after a while, I have kids, and they ask me why questions all the time. After a while, um, like, why? Is it, why? And after a while, I'm like, because it just is. Why? Because it just is. Why? Because it just is. It's like you hit a wall. You can't go any farther because it just is. That actually is true, as you're seeing on this. That's why you're frustrated with me for asking it. Like, I don't know. Why? I don't know. There's no why. Okay? Um, what we're talking about here are, is uh, first principles of all thought and knowledge. All thought and all knowledge are built on what we call first principles. Basic four of them. I'm, not gonna go, I'm only going to go through two of them. These are laws of logic. You use them all the time. You can't not use them. You have to use them. You use them even though you don't even know what they are. Okay? For example, the law of non-contradiction goes like this. Something cannot be both X and not X at the same time and in the same sense. Something can be uh, A and B at the same time. Like I can have a left arm and a right arm at the same time. Okay? But I can't say I have a right arm and I do not have a right arm at the same time and in the same sense. Okay? Like I am a father and I am a son at the same time, but not in the same sense. In other words, not in the same way. And the way or sense that I'm a father, that's the relationship between me and my children. I'm not a son. But in the relationship between myself and my parents, I am a son and I'm not a father. Okay? Um, this cannot be my wife and not my wife at the same time, same sense. And this is my wife. And I always actually get a lot more respect after I put this picture up here. Like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> what the heck? This guy married a supermodel? Yes, it did. <laughs> yes, I married Princess Jasmine. Um, and people are like, well, what has he been saying all along? Because uh, she likes him. I guess he uh, says true things. <laughs> That's the standard. You know I'm right, too. You know I'm right. Uh, this is my wife. But if I went to a bar and I said this is not my wife, and I told somebody else it was my wife, you wouldn't be like, OK. They're both true. <laughs> You'd be like, he's up to something. He wants some women to think he's not married, right? Because he's, uh, he's up to no good. Now, in order to deny the law of non-contradiction, you actually have to use it. Okay? So for example, to affirm this statement, the law of non-contradiction is true. To affirm that, you must deny this. The law of non-contradiction is not true. Are you following? This is deep. Keep, keep tracking with me. Um, it requires you to believe the law of, of non-contradiction cannot be true and not true at the same time in the same sense. But that's using the law. Something can't be X and not X at the same time in the same sense. For example, if contradictions were possible, it wouldn't make sense to affirm or deny anything. If contradictions were possible. If I said Brian is a human and Brian is not a human, they can't both be true. This statement only makes sense if you assume that that has to be false, if that's true. You understand? That has, that's not meaningful at all. For example, if I said, um, uh, there is a law of non-contradiction, or if I said there is no law of non-contradiction, okay, that only is meaningful if there is a law of non-contradiction. So if you deny the law of non-contradiction, what what's wrong with that? You're affirming it. You're, affirming it. You're using it. Did everybody follow that? No. Yes. <laughs> Who's on first? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, watch the tape again, and uh, hopefully you'll get it. Um, the law of identity is, is basically A is A. Everything's identical to itself. Like, what color is blue? Blue. 
Come on, that's a lame answer. What color is blue? Blue. Blue is blue. <laughs> How do you know you can identify blue? Because I can identify blue. How can you? How do you know you can identify an apple? If I actually denied the law of identity and said you cannot identify an apple, what did I just do? Define an apple. It's of course I can. I can see it in abstracted form that's actually the law of identity. You, when you abstract a form, you're doing the law of identity. Okay? Um, to say there is no law of identity, what did I just do? The Identify the law. Isn't that cool? You can't not use it. You have to use it. Isn't that cool? So these are the foundational laws of logic that you use when you think all the time. Um, okay, so how do I, where did I get it from? I don't see the law of non-contradiction. I went what? No, 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 no. Okay. Um, now, uh, correspondence view of truth, and we don't have much longer, just so you know. Okay, uh, it gets a lot faster from here on. What's the definition of truth? You guys have done this before. That which corresponds to reality. Or you want to also make sure you also mention this to, or to its object. Okay, that'll come into play in a second. Okay, um, if something is true, it's true for all people at all times and all places. Now, what about this? And what if I said it's true for me that I own a dog and true for you that you don't? Who, um, who in here does not own a dog? What do you do with your life? <laughs> I know. Mine, I own dogs. They're all saved. Come on. Okay. Um, um, you, you do not own a dog? What's your name? Dan. Huh? Dan. Dan. Okay. The truth is relative. Because I own a dog. It's true for me I own a dog. And it's true for Dan that he does not own a dog. Therefore, truth is relative, right? Yeah, but what's true for me is not true for him. It's not the same sense. Yeah. True for me, but not true for him. There's no contradiction there. It's true for me that I own a dog, true for him it's not, so it's relative. Yeah, here's the thing. It would only be relative if you said, it's true for me that Dan does own a dog, and true for Dan that he does not. But that's a contradiction. So that can't be true. Yeah. See, because we just established the law. There we go. And so um, what you would want to ask is, is that true for everybody? Should everybody believe that I own a dog? If I do. Yes. yes. Should, I, should everybody believe that Dan owns a dog? A, a dog? No. So in other words, it's true for everybody to believe that I own a dog and true for everybody to believe that Dan does not. It's not true about everybody that they own a dog. See what I mean? If something is true, it's true for you to believe. It doesn't mean it's true about you. You see the difference? On that's what they're confusing. Okay? Um, what about this? Um, I always feel hot, and my wife is always cold. Do you have this problem? Your wife is always wrong about the temperature? <laughs> um, I always feel hot. She always feels cold. So which one is true? Is it hot or cold? So it's true for me, it's not true for her. It's true. Here's the thing. Remember, the truth is that which corresponds to reality or to its objects. If I said, is it hot or cold, you would have to say, to whom? You didn't give me an object of correspondence. It's not answerable. Like if I said, aha, she says it's cold, you say it's hot, which one is true? Is it hot or cold? You would have to say, to whom? Because there's no object of correspondence. It's hot or cold to Brian, or hot or cold to... Brian's wife, Gabriella. You understand? So it's not relative because there's no object of correspondence given. So these are examples that people will give to try to argue truth is relative, which it's just sloppy thinking, okay? Relativism is unlivable, okay? It's like, kink it that way, that way, everything's contradiction and not. There's one way, it's the time. Um, nobody actually lives out relativism. Nobody does. Like if a, the cop pulls you over and goes, you're going 80 in the neighborhood. That's true for you, but not for me. <laughs> if uh, yeah, the, the doctors take these pills to live, that's true for you, not for me. All right, you know, you just failed this test. I reject that. I did not. Uh, you know, your bank account's empty. It's true for you, but not for me. I'm writing more checks. Uh, nobody applies that in real life. Okay, so when they say that, just bring up counterexamples. Like, it doesn't work. Okay. Um, Anyway, so a self-defeating statement is a statement that refutes itself. Like if I said no English sentences are longer than three words, you apply it to yourself, you know that cannot be true, okay? So now we're going to start some testing. You ready? We're almost done here. So if I said there's no such thing as truth, what would you say? Very good. Is that true? 
This is softball for you guys, right? Uh, you've heard this before. You can't know anything for certain. Do you know that? You know, I actually, when I first was teaching, I actually used to teach this, that you can't know anything for certain. It wasn't until I went to SES that I realized, oops, I've been teaching some uh, false things for a while. I used to teach everything's based on faith. Everything. Yeah, everything you have, you can't know anything for certain. I taught that. Nobody caught it because they hadn't been trained how to think because they're supposed to be learning from me how to think. But with SES, uh, and I changed everything. Do you know that for certain? Okay, um, You can't know the truth about reality. How do you know that truth about reality? Um, we can't know reality because we impose our views on reality. Very good. Are you imposing that view on reality? Because this is what I got taught in college. You guys get that stuff here? You impose your views on reality so you can't really know reality. In order to know that, if you impose your views on reality, you'd have to be, you'd have to know that reality is unknowable. In other words, to say you're imposing your views on reality, you'd have to be outside of reality, looking in, knowing what reality is, and knowing what I'm doing, to know I'm imposing my views on reality. See what I mean? It doesn't work. It's self-defeating. It sounds all smart and intelligent and scholarly when you're like, you know, you just impose your views on reality. Oh, what's that? Are you imposing that view? What? <laughs> uh, how about this? Uh, if something is true, it must be scientifically observable. Very good. Is that truth scientifically observable? Uh-oh. Well, uh, the scientific method is the only way to prove the truth about reality. Yeah, can you use a scientific method to prove that? Can you use a scientific method to prove the scientific method? Ah. Uh, well, if philosophy is useless, we should only use science. Uh, that a scientific Very good. Is that your philosophy about philosophy and science? Uh, this is why we're Sith Lords, by the way. This is actually from the movie. Revenge of the Sith. Perfect. Yes. If you're not with me, you're my enemy. And then Anakin over here the no, relativist no, no, no. says okay. only a Sith deals in absolutes. Which is in itself an absolute. Yes. So if Anakin had sat through this seminar, then he would have been like, is that an absolute statement, everyone? <laughs> Welcome to the dark side, pal. <laughs> That's why we are Sith Lords. Plus red lightsabers are cooler looking. And we get a Death Star. We just got to remember to cover that hole next time. Okay, is classical empiricism self-defeating? That's the belief that I look at reality in abstract principles. Let's apply that to itself. Classical empiricism is the belief that I look at reality and abstract those principles. Is that a view that we get from observing reality and abstracting it? Yes, is it, it is. Is it when you observe like, the laws of logic? It, well, I don't observe them, I abstract them. Right. I look at reality and then I, ab I abstract from that the laws of logic and all the immaterial principles. So. Uh, classical empiricism is not self-defeating. It is na 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 is abstracted. So is classical empiricism is that something that you got from observing and abstracting? Yes, it is. So it's not self-defeating. Okay. Uh, pluralism is um, all religions are true and they all lead to God. Why is that a problem? Very good. That's a problem because Jesus said, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me." Okay. Um, so if I said all religions are true, it's arrogant and intolerant to think other religions are false. Okay, now watch this. Uh, this is my daughter here. All you have to ask is, is my religion true? What does he have to say? Yes. He's a pluralist. He's going to say, yes, your religion is true. But my religion says yours is false. Oh, dear. What's he going to say? Then your religion is false. He just said that. He just, that's what you led with. It's all true. You can't tell me that I'm wrong. So he could say, well, then maybe that part of your religion isn't true. But he led with saying, well, if you say somebody's religious beliefs are false, then you're arrogant and intolerant. So would it be arrogant and intolerant to think parts of my religion are false? I just think we should tolerate all positions. And you would say, are you tolerant of my position? What's he going to say? Yes, I tolerate all positions. But I think Jesus is the only way to God. Okay, that part isn't true. So the parts of my religion that differ from yours are false. Just act offended. I feel very offended. I'm very hurt by the words that you're using. I feel like you're a bigot. I feel like I need a safe space. Oh Stay away from you because I feel like you're threatening me right now. I don't like the harmful words that you're using telling me that I'm wrong. 
You're not tolerating me. Okay. <laughs> I just think it's wrong to tell others they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. You tell me I'm wrong, just act offended. I'm, I'm so hurt. You tell me that my religion is wrong. Now, we, um, you see these stickers, right? Because you said you're talking about coexist. Uh, uh, I, um, that these are religious symbols here making it coexist. No, I, I would say that there's sort of a message in there that I would agree with. What would I agree with if, it's, if it is the message? Yeah. Yeah, we should all coexist and get along. We should all coexist, but they can't all be true. Why? Because they contradict. Have you seen these stickers? They have these now too. These are also religious symbols. Spelling out, spelling out contradict. Okay. Not cool. They can't all be true. So I would actually say, yes, we should all get along. And by the way, when somebody says all religions are true, I think they, they mean well. I think the, their intent is, what do they want? Peace. Peace. Let's not confront. Let's get along. And I would say, I got that. But it sounds really nice. And it just sounds really naive as well. Um, here's, here's one reason why. Theism says there's only one God. Polytheism, there's lots of gods. Pantheism, you are God. Atheism, there is no God. Can all these be true? No. no why? Law of non-contradiction. They contradict. Okay. Um, these are just four different religions, just three different doctrines. It sounds great to say they're all the same, but they're not. We disagree in every area. <laughs> okay. Um, Christians say one God, three persons. Islam, one God, one person. Hinduism, you're God. Only one God because we're all Him. Buddhism, gods are useless. Um, how are we saved? Grace through faith, works, meditation, get rid of your desires, afterlife, heaven, hell, multiple lives, go back to Brahman, Nirvana. The end is different. The way we're saved is different. The God is different. It's, it's different all across the board. Like it's the same God. What? It's not. Nothing is the same. Stop acting that way. But they, they, people do that. Um, the, Quran, uh, the Bible says Jesus was crucified. The Quran says Jesus was not crucified. They can't both be true. Okay? So, um, now then somebody will say, well, maybe all the religions have a kernel of truth. So maybe we'll say parts of Judaism is true. So watch this up here. Parts of Christianity, parts of Hinduism and Buddhism, parts, parts of all the religions are true. Okay, that sounds nice too. But what, what is he saying about what he left behind? Yes. That's false and that's the true religion. So he's still being exclusive too. You see what I mean? And so if somebody's like, well, maybe parts of them are all true. Well, you're still saying the parts of my religion that you left behind are false. Everybody thinks that their position is true and whatever opposes it is false. And so when people act like you're the intolerant one, if you're a Christian, and I am the tolerant one, no, you're not. You're just as intolerant as I am. So stop acting that way. Why don't we both just be honest and say, I think you're wrong, you think I'm wrong, but we can love each other and get along and we can have a nice, intelligent conversation. Can't we do that? We can do that, right? Um, it, all part, it can't be that all parts of all religions are true because they what? They contradict. Okay? But keep in mind if you're talking to somebody and they have that view, that what is their motive and the intent usually? Peace. Peace. So keep, keep that in mind that they actually are not trying to be a jerk. They just haven't thought it through. Okay? Um, so you can just start bringing up the contradictions and to kind of show how they can't all be true. So lastly, naturalism. Um, all events are from natural causes. There are no supernatural events. Why is that a problem for Christianity? Yes, because we believe in a supernatural being and a supernatural acts of God, like miracles. And if you're going to be at a secular university, it's going to come from the nat naturalistic worldview. Okay? Um, so if I said, nature's all there is, nature can account for everything, you would ask, can nature account for nature? Um, well, nature has always existed. Yeah, did it exist prior to the Big Bang? Oh, dear. Because I do believe in that, don't I? Maybe another universe created that caused ours. And what caused that? Eh, maybe it goes backwards forever. Eh, my dad covers that in the next session. <laughs> He'll also explain how abstracted principles prove that there's a God. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. So don't miss it. If you have me back, we can cover that. Okay, good. Yes, so I'm done here, but I will take questions as long as you want to stay. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's great. Uh, when you get the question, just repeat the question so we get it in. Repeat the, the question so we can get in the mic. Uh, yes, sir. Can you go back to the first part of that argument where, about the nature and natural land? Oh, okay. Between, between you and your son. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, so did, can nature account for nature? Right.
the, the part where you say where your senses can nature account for nature? Mm -hmm. Why can't you? <laughs> uh, nature is like can nature be the cause of nature? Does nature explain okay. nature? Like do I for example, do I explain my own existence? Okay. Is there anything about me that explains why I exist? Can you say can you point to me and say the mechanism for your existence, for your coming to be, is found in me. Is it in me? It's not. It's prior to me. It's outside of me. It's my what? This is like parents. That'd be my parents. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so my parents cannot account for their existence either. Something prior to them. And so the universe itself cannot account for its own existence. So something is prior to it. Yes. What is the difference between naturalism and materialism? Um, they will oft, well, naturalism often would be the worldview, and then within that worldview, you have several different philosophies. Like uh, usually, I actually explain it that way: that naturalism would be the worldview, and then within that worldview, you have materialism, um, scientism, relativism, and then you have what I would call spiritual naturalism. And I would put pluralism in that area. The spiritual naturalism. With a lot of Christians today would, would fit as, or a lot of Americans at least, and some Christians sadly would, would qualify as a spiritual naturalist. Somebody who would say, um, I think that the natural universe is all that's knowable, and I simply believe in a God. And so they're, they're saying that uh, naturalism... They're a naturalist in the sense of how do you know the truth about reality, but they still are spiritual naturalists in the, because they, they choose to believe that there's a God. Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, does that answer your question? Oh, his question. Do I need to repeat it? It's okay now. His question was, what's the difference between materialism and naturalism? Sorry. Yes? So you kind of mentioned that classical empiricism isn't self, uh, right, doesn't, doesn't defeat itself. Right, isn't self-defeating. So how do, we, how do we know that it's true then? Uh, maybe I missed that part. Well, yeah, because that's, that is how you learn about reality, is you look at reality and you abstract principles from it. Okay. The, when, whenever, everything that you learn actually comes somehow from your senses. In fact, that's how Aristotle worded it. There's nothing that's in your intellect that was not first in some way from your senses. Okay. That you, for example... Um, Numbers. The way I learned about numbers is I would see like an apple, and then I see another apple, and then I get the idea of what? More than one apple. There's more than one apple. And so I abstract the concept of two. And then from there, I can then imagine another one, a third one. And then I can start imagining, I can start imagining numbers I've never seen. So, what, for example, I can, um, once I see an object with sides, I see a triangle has three sides, square has four sides. I, I can then start imagining the concept of a one trillion sided figure. I've never actually seen one, but I've taken previous abstracted principles and I can start combining them to imagine something that I've never seen. And that's actually what we do with God's existence. That I'm taking these principles and I'm putting them together to construct the arguments for God's existence. So I don't have to see God, I simply have to abstract these principles. I think it's very important that we actually explain things like that to people because they'll say, well, I don't see God. Show me God scientifically. Well, it doesn't work that way. I, we abstract the principles, and then we start stacking the principles, and that's how we get to um, God's existence. It necessarily follows from our arguments. Yes? Slightly off topic, but also not because it actually came up in a discussion I had with sure. some fellow employees. Uh, would you use that as an argument for consciousness? What abstraction? Yes, the ability to um, abstract and like information I use that. The environment and use it to imagine it further. Um, I haven't thought if I would use that. Uh, the question was, would I use that as an argument for consciousness? Um, I think it's the consciousness is self-evident. What do you mean by consciousness? Do you mean like that there's an immaterial as, soul? As opposed to like uh, intelligence, as opposed to artificial intelligence. Like what defines? The ability to learn, as opposed oh, to like, like, just, like receive information and repeat it. 
can an artificial intelligence abstract principles Not, or is it programmed? I think more just the ability to learn as opposed to recite information. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I, I've never thought about that before, but yeah, I guess you could could try to argue that, that, that do we see computers abstracting? I mean, we don't see anything other, other than us, you know, living creatures that are actually observing things and abstracting computers are, are getting it a different way. I'm, I'm not a computer expert, so well, I'm not I'm exactly not. Well, I'm it more because one of my coworkers, he says he died, but really, like, he was clinically dead, and so... He's like, well, you know, I don't, I didn't see a god. And I'm like, well, first of all, you don't really, I mean, all that means is you don't remember. And so, like, as far as I'm concerned, you really weren't dead. I mean, you were brought close, maybe, but I don't think you were really dead because you're not really coming back from that. Except yeah, that wouldn't be a very good test for so God's like, existence. Would yeah, be, and, well, I was and it kind of developed into consciousness from there. So. Okay. In case you're wondering how that came more? Yes. Hey Brian, could you explain uh, the difference between like naturalism and materialism? Um, I've heard it said some naturalists actually hold that there are like metaphysical realities as to where maybe the materialist just thinks everything is, you know, reduced down to matter. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, the, uh, naturalism is simply the belief that, that nature's all there is or that nature's all that is knowable. Sometimes they'll call it physicalism. And that way they kind of, a lot of times when they do, they're trying to dodge the problem with space being not yeah. material, so they, they'll, they'll kind of broaden it to, to that. Um, but there are naturalists who would be um, like a spiritual naturalist, like I was saying earlier, that will say, I do believe that there's something other than matter, that, there are, that there's an immaterial God, but that cannot be demonstrated in any kind of scientific way. So a, a spiritual naturalist would be somebody who's given into scientism. Like, like um, so then not like a Deepak Chopra then or something? Like um, uh, I'm, I don't know how he would fit. I, 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 yeah, but yeah, pantheists are generally going to be considered um, um, spiritual naturalists because, I mean, they'll deny, you'll have pantheists, some pantheists will deny matter, that matter's not even real, but they'll say that matter is an illusion. Because if, we're, if, if only the infinite being exists, anything that's finite, some pantheists will say, it's not real. Some don't. They'll say, no, that's a mode of being. But a lot of pantheists will say, there's only one being that exists, which is the infinite being. And so I exist, therefore I am the infinite being. And so if I don't, any, any so-called evidence that I'm not infinite must be, therefore, uh, an illusion, maya. That uh, I, it seems that I have limitations. It seems that I'm not infinite, but I, I really am. Yes. So why is matter not an illusion? Why is it not an illusion? Uh, I would say it, it w would be a self-evident truth that that because um, you actually are abs are abstracting that matter is actually formed. Okay. That um, it would be a law of identity. That how, kind of like, how, how do I know I can identify an apple? Well, it's because I can identify an apple. So you can keep telling me I don't, but I, I am. So how do I know I can identify that matter is actually real? It's because it's the law of identity, because I'm identifying that it's real. Yeah. It's self-evident. Okay? Because then you could argue, well, then maybe 2 plus 2 is 4 is illusion. Why not just say that's an illusion? Well, that's also law of identity. Math ends up being law of identity as well. 2 plus 2 is identical to 4. Any further questions, guys? How much wood would a woodchuck chuck a woodchuck chuck wood? Um, three, <coughs> three bundles, if I remember correctly. <laughs> All right, guys. Let's uh, give it up.